Hey, uh, greetings from Warehouse of Strangers Radio, uh, our Pittsburgh campus. Uh, today's a special day for us because, uh, as you can see by our picture here today, on the phone I'm with just a total legend. I don't mean to butter him up too much, but um, a guy who shouldn't need a, a big introduction. Uh, I think his work speaks for himself. Um, but he is a writer, he is a poet, he is a sculptor, a uh, puppeteer, which we'll get into a little bit, which is surprising, um, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But you probably know him best as the co-founder of Crass, who is, um, I would say, undisputably one of the most important punk bands of all time, if you want to call them punk. Uh, but yeah, so we're here today. Uh, with a Mr. Steve Ignorant, and I think we're all happy to see you, Steve, and how you doing? I'm doing fine, mate. Great. Uh, Steve, I gotta tell you, when you agreed to this interview, uh, the first thing I thought to ask you was, you know, I listen to Crass's lyrics now, and it's 40-some years later, and those lyrics and those ideas and those concepts are still so bold, uh, controversial, challenging, and so I think as a young guy, because you're, you, at the time you're in your late teens, early 20s, uh, mid 20s, my, my first question, my, the first thing I thought of was when you're on stage in, in a hostile environment, because you guys had problems with everybody, you had problems left, right, and center, um, so what effect does that have on you? kind of internally as a young guy, like how, how, where are your emotions at that time? Are you, I mean, is it exhilarating? Is it terrifying? Does, does, some, does a situation like that make you like paranoid? I guess what, what's the cost on your humanity of, of saying those things? So it's a situation where you're like, maybe you don't want to get ashtrays on you, but the desire to express yourself and the desire for freedom was greater than any kind of consequence. Where no 
So I guess, uh, too, Steve, so, you know, th these lyrics that were, I'd say, I mean, Crass was a full-on assault one way or another, visually, uh, musically, lyrically, um, but concerning, like, the lyrics, I, I guess my question is, is kind of about authorship. I wondered about um, what Crass's creative process was like and what... Um, Lyrically, was was it a hundred percent your creation, or was it you know that you were taking ideas from everybody and it was coming through yourself? I mean, I guess I'm curious as to the authorship of the lyrics and to, to actually, additionally, the music too. How did that work? Um, well, none of the, I have to stress that none of us were musicians. Right. Um, when, me and, when me and Penny Man both first got together, you know, we played drums. Very military. Well, you must have heard the original. I was a living. Oh, yeah, sure, like the demos, yeah. yeah. Get to the end, you know. um, and I just wrote the lyrics and pen drum to it. Um, well, when more people joined the band, it became crass, the band, as everyone knows it now. Yeah. Um, people started writing their own songs and I would sing them. So, um, you know, I, I'm assuming by authorship you mean where did the inspirations come from? Well, yeah, I, I, I guess the... the uh, well, and you bring up an interesting point that I never thought of. Like, so other people are, are writing kind of lyrical ideas too, and then and then you're you're kind of presenting their lyrical ideas. Was there ever a time where where there was clashes in in like ideology and and maybe like where you're like, well, I, I you know I, I I kind of don't want to say that, or was it was there anything like that I going? Mean, no, no, no. I remember one time uh, people like right come to me. Uh, no, Penny Rambo comes to me with a song, and uh, it was about. Uh, he said to me, we've got a new song, and all that. And uh, he goes, <laughs> when he goes like this, and it's, it's 621984, father and mine are for dead. It's uh. 621994, shot me in the back of the head. And it's taking his coat to you, and I went, Pen, I can't sing that. I look, I'm going to write like, twat on stage. <laughs> yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I've got to move on to an old bit, mate. Right. right. And it's exclusive lyrics and exclusive vocals you've got there. <laughs> so uh, if you put it on the internet, I'll teach you. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I like used to work, none of us were musicians, uh, we all had different, um, and I think that's where the weirdness of Crass's music, if you can call it that, came from. Um, none of us have done anything like this. A couple of the members have been in folk band before. Right. But all of the influences, I mean, I'm coming from a background of the Who, um, reggae, ska, you know, I'm skinning up, bringing, um, the original ones I hasten to add. Right. Um, that's a, that's a damn and, shame. You know, and David Bowie, of course. Now, Penny Rambo's coming from his jazz background, Sonny Rollins, Miles Davis, you know, Charles Mingus, um, plus with a little bit of Shostakovich and uh, Bach in there. Pete Wright, the bass player, is coming from Frank Zappa. Um, you know, so there's all these different influences. And because we weren't musicians, we weren't caught in the area of like, well, it's got to be, you know, C, G, and D. Right. And it's got to be the bridge. So we just made it up as we went along. Why should, you know, who, who in the music world says, you know, that um, the core, the, you know, the verse has to be um, eight, eight bars long. Right. Um, you know, I say eight lines, um, eight lines long, and then the, the core's got to be four, and then you do a bridge thing. No, let, let's make the um, let's make the first seventeen, and then the chorus will be one line, and then you know we'll do the we won't do a bridge thing, so that's boring, and we'll just do another five and a half. Right. You know, so that was like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess that's the thing is to me, you know, I, I've heard other people say, well, crass weren't musicians and blah, blah, blah. But I have to say there's really musical things going on. But I think you're right. It's it's like you guys knew enough intuitively about music to get it going, but weren't 
restricted by knowing too much, maybe, you know? Well, and also, also sorry to interrupt you, but um, the no, way no. it worked was, you know, that, um, that we'd come up with the lyrics and then we'd say, well, let's make the, let's make the, um, the soundtrack. Right. You know, a bit like making a film. Let's make that fit the lyrics. So, for example, Mother Earth. Oh, I love that um, one. She's about to, you know, a murderess and a murderer. Um, you know, who killed kids back in the 60s. Um, you know, I remember being in the rehearsal room, you know, there at the dark house. We apparently went, um, you know, to feel free and event right now. Phil, uh, make your guitar sound, sound like you're stabbing someone. Right. Um, and, and that's the way we used to work. It, it wasn't, uh, oh, let's make it all nice and, you know, let's make it sound like a clash or, you know, or this. Let's make it sound like this. So it's like, um, really, you know, we were making... I don't know, like almost like film soundtracks. It, right. You know, we weren't doing it in a conventional way, and that's why, you know, when people say, "Oh, you know, Crash was a punk band," were we? You know, because you know, punk to me, you know, I, I'm instantly, you know, the Clash's first album. That to me is the sound of punk. Right. So you know, but then we weren't as we weren't as bizarre as like Flopping Gristle and Coom and all that lot. Like. Well, you bring up I Mother, know, you bring up Mother Earth. I almost think. When I listen to Mother Earth, it's it's almost like theater. Am I am I right to say? I mean, it's almost like uh, sonic theater. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. But I mean, also what you're getting there is I remember doing the vocals for that, and I so I just scream my guts out. I think that's the one because I used to have um, pretty bad acne when I was a kid, uh -huh. you know, when I was younger, and I screamed so hard, up, you know, not one of my pimples, but, but <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> No, it, it, it totally comes through. Uh, it, it's intense. It's intense business that song, and, and, and uh, I, I, that's one of my favorites. And I think it's uh, the weird thing is a lot of people think that's about environmentalism, but it's about Myra Hindley, who who was um, a fair to say a type of serial killer in England, killed children, and then and I. I Yeah. Um, do whatever they did, uh, kill them and bury them on the, on the horse, you know. So, you know, the environmental bit, um, there's a bit, you know, I'm reluctant to sort of say it, but, you know, if you're sort of talking about recycling, if you throw in peat bogs in that way, then you've got a pretty sick mind. Yeah, you know, right. That's not, it's not about, you know, environmental at all. It's about to evil, you know, well, sorry to use the word evil, but to really horrible people. Right. Know, but, um, the reason that song was written, um, was because the newspapers here had nothing else to write about. Um, and something they bought out, a, uh, one of the newspapers uh, said, uh, you know, Myra Hindley, should she be released? This is when she was still alive. Right. And of course, there was this whole thing of, like, no, let her write out. The only reason it was done was to sell newspapers. Yeah. Um, now, um, and that's what the song is about. Um, there was a point where I felt very uncomfortable singing about, you know, doing that song. Right. Um, Right. Um, but uh, so I said to Ken, you know, look, you've got to explain this to me, mate, because you know, if I get asked about it, um, and uh, so it's not a glorification of it. It's, it really is about you know the media will take will use anything it wants to and doesn't give two hoops. Right. I hope you'll notice I'm being, being very clever about not swearing. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, you can swear or not swear. I mean, we're we're we're, we're Americans over here, man. Swearing is our uh, is our part of our uh, daily lives for sure, man. Uh, right, well, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, you. Um, now, now, Steve, you, you were mentioning guys like Phil Free and Penny Rambo. Uh, so all you guys, and, and this is kind of something pe I I think people have an inkling of, but maybe they don't know is. You guys all live together in essentially, you know, all the crass, people in crass and involved with crass lived in kind of uh, a house together. You had a shed out back that you would practice in. Day, so day and night, crass is going, it's a all, and you've said crass wasn't really a band. It was like, I mean, it's a, it's a life. You guys were just living it 24 seven. 
Um, my question is, so, so you do that for, for what, eight years? And when that comes to an end, you know, what, where did, what happens to your life then? Where do you go from there? Do you stay at Dow House for a while? Or do you, at that point, do, do people start moving away? Or, or what, what does your life look like post crash? Yeah. Well, that happened. And then we all looked at each other and went, what the fuck was all that about? And then we took time and was like, well, what the, what the hell do we do now? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously Andy Palmer, you know, B.A. Nana, Harry Shree Nana, whatever his name is. <laughs> It's pretty you know, rough. It shouldn't have been called, you know, it shouldn't have been called, you know, it shouldn't have been called, it should have been members of the class. Yeah. Performing Penny Rambo's techno for the summer. That, that was all we do with this dad dying and all this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but we all looked at each other and um, it took about, um, I don't know, it took about two years, you know, and then it's like, you know, uh, various people sort of left uh, Dial House, which is, you know, what the place is called. Right. Oh, really? You know, yeah, yeah, I stayed there, I stayed there. It was a beautiful place to live, you know, and um, I was there, you know, after class uh, had finished, I was there on my own a lot. Um, but that's when I got, you know, I thought, well, what, the, what, what am I going to do? And that's when I thought, I did the classic thing. I would, I'll do a solo album. And I'll, I'll do a solo album about, because I've always been interested in it. Um, I'll do a, a solo album about Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Saucy Jack. <laughs> and I was like, well, I can't do that. And that's when I started writing about um, Punch and Judy. Yeah. Which goes into the puppeteering thing. Yeah, exactly. I guess we should talk about that a little bit. Um, so for, for those who don't know, and I, I don't think most Americans will know, because, I, I mean, I didn't know. Um, but so you get into this um, puppeteering, this, this stuff that's called Punch and Judy. And for those who don't know... Uh, Punch and Judy style puppeteering is it, it, fair to say, Steve, that it's like the the two puppets, the puppeteers behind the little box, and they usually no, kind of. One. Uh, it, it's one puppet. One, no, it's one person. Oh right, yeah, yeah, one one puppeteer, two puppets, and they and they kind of they like fight a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what? I mean. Did, were you interested in that as a kid? I mean, where where does how, how do you connect with with that? with that culture? Well, I had, um, when I was a kid, um, when I was a child, they used to, uh, the local council, uh, I don't know what you call it over there, um, I don't know what the English, anyway, because uh, we lived on the, you call it projects. Yeah. We call them council estates. Oh, right, like, yeah. Yes, yeah, so and the council would, every summer, for, would bring magicians and, you know, um, blow up balloons and make animals out of them. And always the classic was the Punch and Judy show. And I used to watch this thing, but it used to scare the head out of me. It was this, um, <laughs> you know, this horrible, red-nosed, hunchbacked, crippled character, you know, um, whacking his wife around. Right. And I, and I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to research it. I had a, I had a book from um, Victorian Science, and it gave a script um, of a Punch and Judy show, which in those days wasn't called Punch and Judy, it was just called Punch. Okay. Right. And so I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm actually going to sort of look into this. And it, turn, it turns out that um, it's, it, you know, Punch um, started in Italy, uh, as far as we know. Uh, it moved up through Europe into France. Um, I think in Italy it was called, uh, oh, Polichinella, something like that. Yeah. What, you, you were called Punch? <coughs> Did you say you were called Punch? No, uh, the actual show wasn't called Punch. 
Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Um, but the thing is, back in Victorian times, it used to just be done on three corners. Right. Um, and he became a, a punched actual character, became a, a, a working class hero uh, because this, um, you know, this drunk um, hunchback cripple, and I can't be PC about it, that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, he used to cheat the hangman into his own nose. He used to um, beat the policeman and not get arrested. Um, and goes on about that, oh, that's, you know, un PC. Yeah, but back in the day when it was being, you know, when Punch was performed, it was actually legal for English, you know, uh, men to be their wives. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't, it, you know, that's the deal that we're talking about. Right. So it's gone through many, many different changes, but the whole thing about it, because it was so bizarre and it still sort of, you know, the, the show that I do, um, and I stick very close to, to the original. Obviously now, if you come to an Okay. You know, the whole bizarreness of it really attracted me. Um, and so, the fact that he always wears red and black. Right. And now, are you still doing, uh, do you still do that today, Steve? Very, very rarely. Um, the characters I made back in 19, whenever it was, uh, are made from paper mache. Right. Um, so they're very delicate. But every now and then, if there's a special thing that I, you know, yes, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, and people always come up and say that was, you know, uh, I, you know I forgot it was like that. Uh, yeah, it is because it is a you know it's not just the gratuitous violence. There's actually a, the, the, there's actually a story behind it. Yeah, it's funny because it's from your description, it almost sounds like you know I'm, I'm curious is if the whole anti-authoritarian angle was maybe what appealed to you too, because you said like Punch is always uh, cheating, cheating the hangman, which would be kind of representative of the. Of the monarchy, I assume a little bit, or or legal system in in Britain. Well, yeah, not, not only that, but you know, back in the eighteen hundreds, you know, um, the uh, when they were still hanging people, you know, publicly, uh, the medical profession uh, was very young, and uh, you know, so they always used to be a doctor in the old Punch and Judy shows, uh, but the medical profession was hated because what they would do was get the bodies of the um, executed. And use them for experiments. Yeah. You know, without telling the relatives. Oh, yeah. You know? um, so they were hated. So, um, and also things like, um, uh, you know, there, there used to be, it doesn't exist anymore, there was, but there was a blind beggar. And um, the blind beggar would knock on Punch's door. And Punch would open the door, and the blind beggar would be blind, didn't have the door <laughs> open. So he'd, he'd hit Punch on the nose with a stick. And um, he'd say, I'll give you. Totally. I, I have something. Uh, thing, you know? Right. I, my wife and I actually talk about that all the time, Steve. And I always say, if, you know, because I'm a World War II uh, buff, and when you read these accounts of war, I always think, you know, if, if if more people understood what what war is, I mean, it's not about glory. I mean, it's about uh, horror and terror, and, and, and um, it, it's nothing to celebrate in, in any way. You know, if you actually knew what it was, you know. Absolutely, and thank you know, thank God I've never had to sort of see it firsthand. But, right. You know, black Christ, you know, it's it's an ugly, ugly thing. You know. Right. Now, um, I I guess another, you know, we talked about the puppeteering. It was pretty surprising to me when I when I got into your history. I tell you, um, something else that w uh, another surprise was that in two thousand seven. You you moved to where you are now, which is a coastal town. We'll just say, um, yeah. and you 
became a part of a volunteer uh, nautical life-saving crew. Um, yeah. So now is that something you're still doing? I mean, I think most, and what, how do you get into do it? I mean, that's pretty heavy stuff. How do you get into that? <laughs> it was me. It was, well, I did this gig in Shepherd's Bush, but I did two gigs. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously if I could afford it, I'd like to give, you know, donate something to some sort of cause. So I like this money. I was like, relaxed. And I went down the local pub. Um, we was open there. And the lifeboat crew always used to be in there. And I could see them in their shirts and things, you know. And I thought, oh, you know, do you know what? I'll donate it to them. So um, I donated a, a load of money to the local lifeboat crew because then I could see where the money went. Right. And I knew it, I knew it wasn't going to go on, you know, the, someone's petrol or administration. Right. Um, donated the money. Um, and I said, oh, you know, thank you. Filmed it and everything, you know. And, um, and I said, well, why don't you come out and see what we do? And I went, all right. So they dressed me up in the bloody dry suit and, you know, chucked me in all with the sea and picked me up and all this. And I said, how about doing it? I went, I'd love to, but I can't commit because of the nature of what I do. Yeah. And they said, no, because I thought it was going to be like if you join the um, fire brigade or, um, you know, the firefighters or the police, that you have to stand on parade, you know. And I said, I can't do it. But the way it works, if you're voluntary, um, is that as much time as you can give, if, it, if it's 15 minutes, if that's what you give, that's what you give. Right. Um, if, it, if it's four hours, that's what you give. And I thought, well, okay, if it's that, sort of, you know, relax. So uh, me being me, and they bought me a couple of drinks, and the <laughs> And they know about your background, right? You had them on stage at one of your Last Supper shows? Yeah, Last Supper, yeah, the Last Supper, um, the Last Supper gig at uh, Shepherd's Bush. You know, because, um, you know, when, the, when we used to go for training or, you know, uh, once the page would go, you'd run up there, you never knew what he was going to. Well, one day I went up there, my God, that sea. It was just like horrible. It was grey and it looked like mountains. Yeah, know, oh, and, man. And So it was kind of a, it was a tit for tat then. Absolutely. Yeah, right. pretty cool I saw footage of it um, uh, the other things uh, you know we're talking about surprises here and things that are surprising about your uh, about yourself and the things you do I have to say too one of the things that came out of the research for this interview is of course I knew about crass and, and, and things like, and the more uh, punk punkier stuff that you've done but I didn't know about slice of life which 
um, is your current musical project. Um, and what it is is kind of, you know, it's strange to me because it's a, to, this is just my opinion. This is exactly what you would want to hear if you were, if you liked Crass and, and now, you know, you, you're your age and you're doing what you're doing. This to me is exactly what you would want to hear. It's, um, it's a continuation of the style of Crass. I would fair to say a little bit, just meaning um, it, it's it's yourself with um, with a musical accompaniment, a little sophisticated. It's more like uh, uh, acoustic instruments, pianos, um, things like that. Now, do you see this the, your slice of life project as um, kind of a reinvention, or is it more like you know this this is a continuation of what you do, which is observe fair to say life around you and, and kind of report on that backed with with kind of a, a little bit more of a unconventional musical backdrop it well, well um, i mean the way it came about was that i mean i wanted to work with um acoustic stuff for a long long time you know i did when i was in a band called um schwarzenegger yeah and i wanted i wanted to use um string sections and brass sections but of course i didn't know how to do it i couldn't even afford it um, but I remember being on stage at Shepherd's Bush for the last supper, you know, and, um, you know, when the lifeboat crew came on all that. And I remember standing there thinking, my God, we're so polished, you know, the musicians I was working with right. were so, you know, professional. Yeah. And I thought, if I, was a, if I was a 15, you know, 14 year old kid coming in, I'd look at what we were doing and think there's no way I'd ever be able to do that because it's, it's so professional. Right, right. And That's your, um, hey, that's I'm your... Sorry, it's, sorry to interrupt you, but it's all those years of you know, the back of rack and, you know, uh, um, you know, um, all those Johnny Mitchell, that sort of thing. I just want it to be, I just want it to be simple. Um, and if there are more bands coming out, and I really hope that more bands um, strip down what they're doing it and do acoustic sense, because then you can hear what the lyrics are saying. Right. No, yeah, totally. I, I have to say, too, I find the lyrics... When I was trying to say, you know, this if you if if Crass and Steve Ignorant was um, your hero, that this is kind of what you would want to hear now. To me, as a, as an adult, because it's the same type of insight into things, but at the same time, to me, it's it, it's warmer. It, it, it's it's life experience between Crass and now. You know, it's it's more human. It's more warm. But at, at the same time, it's still a pretty sharp look at, at, at what's around you, you know? I'll, I'll, you know, thanks for that. Um, that's, that's really nice like, because what I'm trying to do is, well, as a, you know, I'm not saying I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm 59 years old, you know, but so what the hell do I write about, you know, anti-government, anti-clean, I've done all of that. Right. You know, so now what I'm writing about is, um, you know, uh, the aches and pains I get walking upstairs, <laughs> you know, the ingrowing toenail. Um, whatever you know, um, the, the um, you know the um, you know the, the dark times I had. You know, the not I don't get depressed, but I do get despair. Right. Um, when I have to go under the duvet um, for you know for two days, um, you know that kind of thing, and that's what I'm trying to address now. 
very good stuff. Uh, Steve, I wondered if you would, um, we have a couple questions from our group members that, that I, I promised I'd do my best to pass on to you. Um, okay, so uh, our group member, Ben Varga, he would like to ask you, what band or musician is your biggest influence and why? Yeah, hey, <laughs> you know, if it's quality, yeah, it's, it's quality, it's you know. Be, it's got to be Leonard Bernstein. Yeah. And Stephen Sondheim, who loves lyrics and that music. Wow, that's surprising. I think that would surprise a lot of people, but hey, I mean... Yeah, I know, it's weird, isn't it? But, you know, that's, that, uh, when I first saw that film, I was blown away. Just absolutely fantastic. Incredible. Um, yeah. So, pa our, our group members, Patrick Walsh and Matthew Guillory, they both wanted to know, Steve, uh, your opinion on the Antifa movement. On the what? Antifa movement? I guess it's like the new worldwide, it's like an anti-fascist group, and, and so they've been showing up to protest things, and, and a lot of times, I guess, violence breaks out, and they're an anti-fascist group. To be honest, I, I didn't know all that much about it myself, because I try to just... Uh, uh, bury my head in the sand a little bit on that type of stuff, but but yeah, so they're they're an anti-fascist group that, um, and I think supposedly like an anarchy group, um, but they've been a lot in the news a lot lately. Are you are you familiar with them or what they're doing? No, not at all. But all I can say is that if there's a bunch of fascists walking around shouting and screaming. Well, you know, um, they're 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 not going to change the world. So I don't know what they're doing. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, but um, but just don't you know don't do wanton destruction. Right. You know, keep, keep it focused and, and you know you know go for the targets that you're aiming for. Go for those right wing, like fucking arseholes. Right. Right. Um, okay. Uh, one last question from our group members. Todd Grote would like to ask you uh, what keeps you motivated to carry on your message. Yeah, so it, 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 you just want to stick it to that guy. <laughs> Mate, I want to stick it to everyone. Like, yeah. You know, just because, yeah, I still want to stick it to everyone. Yeah. I don't you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never, you know, I used to be an angry young man. I've been an, you know, an angry middle-aged man, and now I'm going to be an angry old man. And, you know, I can't fucking wait to bring it on. Yeah, all right. Um, Steve, now, uh, as a final little segment here, um, you are you have been gracious enough to submit to the Warehouse of Strangers Radio either or game, which is where we present uh, our interviewees with a uh, series of short either or questions. Um, and so we got about ten of those for you. And it, and again, it's meant to get a little peek into who you are without peeking too much. Okay. Okay. So here's the first one. Uh, in the e Warehouse of Strangers either or game uh, Beatle Beatles or Stones Beatles or Stones yeah Beatles Beatles okay yeah. dogs or cats dogs yeah I, th I thought you were you have a I've seen you in, in interview clips with a white dog right do you, you still yeah, used to that one died. I got a new one English yeah. oh cool uh, okay, uh, next question. White bread or wheat bread? That's a toughie. Uh, I'm on there to explain. Yeah, sure. All uh, right. Well, um, if it's a proper meal, uh, wheat bread. Uh, but if it's just a snack, white bread. Okay, makes sense. Um, next question. City or country? Country. Country. Um, okay, next question. Uh, Penny Rambo or John Bonham? <laughs> oh, Penny Rambo. <laughs> all, all the way, right? Yeah, definitely. 
Okay, um, you have to forgive my ignorance. I assume you guys have peanut butter in Britain, right? I apologize for asking that, but, you know, I, I'm not super from you, you guys do have peanut butter, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, crunchy or creamy? Crunchy. Okay, good answer. Uh, morning person or night owl? Uh, are you a morning person or a night owl? Night owl. Night owl. Yeah, definitely. Okay. This this next question, I, I have to give give a little background to it for Americans. Uh, beans are a pretty big deal in, in the UK, from what I understand, and the, and there, yeah. there's a little bit of a debate here. So I'd like to know, Heinz or Branston's? Oh, see, I just want to cheat this one. Yeah. Who, which one's cheaper over there? Or they, it, it, depends what shop you, it depends what supermarket you go to. But uh, I would go. Oh, I've got to explain it again. That's okay. Go for it. That's the problem. You see, um, what you're talking about is beans, and they're haricot beans in tomato sauce. Now, when you open the tin, there's a lot of liquid in there. Yeah. And what, what most people do, well, I'm going to let you into a secret. Okay. Okay. Don't do that, put them in a frying pan. Oh, okay. Do them really hot, right, at a really good heat, because then all the liquid um, sort of gels and goes into this really thick sort of sauce. That's a... Uh... That then you put it on your toast, and it don't matter what, what um, brand you buy, it will always do it. The liquid will always sort of absorb into the bean. So it... HP, yeah. Yeah, squirt that over the top and then grate cheese over it if you're not vegan. Right. Um, enjoy yourselves. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, going back to your question, <laughs> Heinz or Branson, just for the. I'll go Heinz. Heinz. Okay. Yeah. Um, Heinz, incidentally, made in my hometown right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the, in the good old USA. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, next, que next either or question. Um, Kate Middleton or Meghan Markle? You <laughs> Kate Middleton or Meghan Markle? Uh, Kate, well, Meghan Markle is Prince Harry's new uh, fiance. And who is the first one? Kate Middleton, who is uh, Prince William's wife. Uh, Kate Middleton. Okay. She's got a nice smile. Yeah. She's a stunner. Well, yeah. Um, but the, the model thing is, it's like she's always, she's pretended to do that or what. So, you know, yeah. You know, I, she know she, I guess she knows where her bread's buttered and what, you know what I mean? And what and what she needs to do, you know. Okay, real quick, well, as as an aside, can I... The, uh, well, when, she, when she eats bread, the crust will cut off. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I don't know if I can trust somebody that doesn't eat crust at that age. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Steve, last question. This is, this is probably the most important of all. Uh, when it comes to orange juice, pulp or no pulp? No pulp. No pulp? No pulp. That's surprising to me. No, but I'm not fixing it. Oh, okay. Because you went with crunchy on the peanut butter, so I thought... Yeah, I know. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the solids. Yeah, I like a bit of substance, but liquid. <laughs> Hey, that, that makes sense to me, Steve. Hey, yeah. Steve, uh, on behalf of everybody in the Warehouse of Strangers radio Facebook page, we'd like to thank you so much for uh, for taking the time. You're certainly one of our heroes. Most of us in the group, you know, totally love Crass, uh, love Slice of Life now that, we, you know, that I've discovered it and a lot of other people knew about it prior to me. But um, so thank you so much for taking the time. I'm going to shut the camera off here, Steve, if you could hang on a minute just so I could... Uh, say bye. Okay, so thanks again, Steve.